like literally, if you if you overlay the maps between conflict and where the yes. sand flies are that are infected with leishmaniasis, you'll see it's almost a perfect match. A lot of the people who get cutaneous leishmaniasis here are in conflict areas. Um, and so that has a lot of implications and has had a lot of implications given Colombia's like very long history. So they had the official end to their 54-year civil war, the signing of the largest peace deal with the FARC, yeah. um, still ongoing peace processes with, with ELN. Uh, but broadly, this means that there was a period of time where the Colombian government was able to and actively did use diagnosis of cutaneous leishmaniasis in order to identify dissidents. And so for a while there was this weird um, kind of give and take where we did have a lot of cases, but we didn't necessarily know, but we suspected they were there because people were avoiding coming to the doctors to actually get treated. The actual kind of standard of care, it's um, a heavy metal or an antimonial drug, mm -hmm. so it's something that in the past past we might have used as like a chemotherapy. So you can imagine like pretty invasive, but also pretty toxic. Mm -hmm. And so here it was on like a list of restricted access medicines. And so in order to ask for the treatment, you actually had to request from the government in order to get the treatment. And so if you're in, you know, an ex part of the country which has a lot of paramilitary activity or like a lot of um, uh, guerrilla activity, then you're asking for these, they would cross-check the names mm -hmm. in order to see if they could identify and then take care of dissidents. So that dissuaged a lot of people from yeah. seeking treatment. It's very interesting is the fly, it's a sand fly, so you've probably run across them as you move up. They're definitely in Peru, they're definitely in Ecuador. We the work little with, tiny ones? The little tiny oh, ones, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm actually kind of allergic to sand fly bites, which I find it like really funny that I study them. <laughs> <laughs> the first time that I got covered in them, I actually had to go get uh, a steroid injection because oh, wow. my entire legs had like inflamed all the way up and I like could not walk. I couldn't fit into my shoe. I think my foot grew like twice the size. I kind of like I had elephantitis. I was like, oh, okay, this is filiaris. Okay. Great. <laughs> He's great. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those little tiny sand flies. And um, so they're obviously found in the jungle, but they're also known to be um, associated with conflict and quote unquote poor hygiene, mainly just if you can imagine right now, there's a big outbreak in Syria. It's a highly stigmatizing disease, especially if you get it on the face, you know, again, the association with poverty, the association, and, and what's interesting is like in, say, the Middle East, where there's another like huge um, set of, of cases, uh, for lack of a better word, um, here the stigma more had to do with the conflict, right? Mm -hmm. You had one of these, it was maybe because you were involved with something else, but it wasn't until people really started to like break that down that the vast majority of people that were coming in were actually like farm workers mm -hmm. or like kids, and clearly they had like nothing to do with it. Yeah. But there, there is a lot of cases in the Colombian military, and I think in 2015 they had like 20,000 cases just in wow. the military. Now that Colombia has kind of started and initiated its peace process, they, they think that it's a hopeful story for the future of leishmaniasis in Colombia in the sense that now hopefully people will seek out treatment. The government is now uh, free of charge providing treatment to anyone who has a positive diagnosis and they're trying really hard to identify all of these cases, get them treated and, and kind of really work on also a lot of um, like prevention and education techniques. And so I find it really fascinating that uh, the leishmaniasis, number, like the number of cases of leishmaniasis here have been so linked to the conflict and kind of having been here as it, it's, it's moving from like post-conflict slash conflict stage mm -hmm. into the actual post-conflict peace process. And we're still going through that whole process. And, and also Narcos clearly has a role in all this too. Yeah. If you think of like where coca grows, mm -hmm. where they have coca fields, where they um, can have tree cover. Exactly, like, tree cover, mm -hmm. all of this stuff. And so there's there's been a huge play you know, from both of those veins coming in. It's it's not quite the most random fact that it overlays, but I think it's very important to note that they do overlay. Because it would make sense, right, if you're talking about a fly that's in the jungle, yeah. cocoa grows in the jungle, you can hide as a gorilla mm -hmm. in the jungle, then yeah, of course. But I also think that it's, as a result, has made it very hard for us to target and treat. Yeah. Um, because those are places where... Primarily, you couldn't even travel to in Colombia until just a few years ago. So where is the where does the medicine come from? Uh, so that's actually even more interesting that there is actually an oral treatment. Mm -hmm. So that's called multiphysin, um, and the problem with that it was actually a really cool idea at the time. Um, so I think the Drugs for De Neglected Disease Initiative had a, a PPP. 
public-private private partnership in order to stir drug development for neglected diseases, because in general they're highly neglected also in terms of the amount of research dollars uh, that actually go towards creating new drugs. Uh, so Multivis in itself was a former chemotherapy for breast cancer, uh, which I find really interesting. Oh. And they were doing some drug screening and found that it actually had pretty high uh, efficacy against cutaneous leishmaniasis. So awesome story. Yeah. Uh, the end result of it was originally you had... Um, the idea was that by giving them a free license, or, you know, like in the United States, we have all these, like, priority review voucher systems for getting FDA approval and, and, and whatnot. And the idea was that if they gave them, a, you know, a priority review voucher, if they were given kind of exclusive rights to this drug to develop and, and market, that they would make sure that it was affordable in all these countries that are endemic uh, for cutaneous leishmaniasis. And so what ended up happening is that they actually didn't make it very affordable in the end. So once their, their terms of, of agreement uh, ran out, mm -hmm. they didn't make really much of an effort at all in order to make it um, financially viable or sustainable within the, within the country. And so, for example, in India, what they found out is so there's one main um, company that had rights to the drug, uh, but because it was so expensive and because access was so hard, there were other people who were making counterfeit versions of the drug, which actually didn't contain either the right drug or the right amount of drug. And so then there started being, and there still is, emerging resistance to that treatment over in India. But what it looks like, if you were to imagine uh, how much it costs, I guess this is, a, this is a cool statistic. So I think originally when it was first licensed, maybe in like 08 or so, it cost about $30 in an endemic uh, lower middle income country. Um, and per now... Shot. Per, per regimen, per pack okay. of, of the pills. Which is a month. Yeah, which okay. is a month. Um, 28 days. And then, flash forward like six years, and that same thing would be about 300. And we're talking, again, still low and middle income countries, right? And if you were to take that same exact drug and sell it to someone who lives in the U.S., we're talking 30000 to 50000 Yeah. Um, it'd be great if that money that they're clearly making on the pills in the U.S. What? went no. back to then subsidize the cost uh -huh. in the developing world. But I can tell you straight up, the $300 U.S. Dollars is something that no patient here can pay. No. Um, and no. like I said, we provide the treatment for free, um, the Miltificin, um and what's the name of your organization? So this is CDAIM, Center for Training, International Training and Training and International Medicine. Oh, it's in so Spanish, okay. but uh, <laughs> oh, uh, CDAIM. Uh -huh. um, but all across, there's, I mean, there's uh, many amazing institutes in, in Columbia that are doing great work with leishmaniasis, and all of them do receive um, the treatments. It's, it's paid for by the, by the government, vastly. Um, but also there is a lot of, there's, there's a lack of access to uh, particularly multifacin because it is so expensive, it's hard to find here, but it also hasn't been um, very well produced either. They kind of, when they, again, when they, they like, after their golden window where they were like, we're going to fulfill the requirements of whatever, they kind of just dropped the ball. Um, and so, again, like when you think of the number of cases that wanted it in India versus the amount that they're able to fulfill, which is why this secondary drug market that was all counterfeit, like, popped up, it's because they weren't making enough. And so even though Multificent actually works really well in Columbia, it's pretty hard for us to find it. Wow. Uh, so we have mainly the people who come, uh, who we see, like I said, we do have a lot of children down in, like, the, our two Pacific coastal sites, uh, but often we still have majority men. Uh, so it kind of avoids, like, it, we don't care that you can't take it if you're pregnant. The men aren't pregnant. Yeah. Um, but it is much more useful for us to hand off a pack of pills to someone than of needles and ampules and so it's just to me it's, it's a shame but it's it's literally just we cannot find multiplicity here um, but we had like three packs for like six months oh, just wow. because we literally could not get any more um, I'm a chemical and biomedical engineer so my research aside from the fact that you can tell there's a lot of reasons why I think Columbia makes it very interesting to work here um, I also in general from my experiences chatting with patients and doctors think that the current treatment we have and the current way that we deliver the treatment are really poor and I think we can do better. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that there's not a lot of engineers who are really focused within a global health or public health space and that's a space that I very much want to work in. Um, you can call it whatever you want, whether it's humanitarian engineering mm -hmm. or, or you know just regular health engineering, yeah. public health engineering. So knowing all this and having spent a lot of time um, in Latin America as I was growing up um, and then even through college, I have always been obsessed with 
uh, parasites. I'd like to say that I never met a microbe that I didn't like. <laughs> Um, and so I've worked on anything from like chagas to malaria to guinea worm, um, and finally ended with uh, obviously leishmaniasis. And in between there, you know, you have brief love affairs with viruses. You know, I feel like everyone when you first read like the hot zone, you're like, I'm gonna work with Ebola for the rest of my life, and then <laughs> and you see things unfold. But I always knew that I wanted to work kind of within global health engineering. And so I think having an engineering mindset, though, really allows you to tackle a problem from a different viewpoint. Um, and so I feel like I've just been so blessed with the connections that I've made and, and you know, the partners that I have here in Columbia. We have some of the most like, brilliant doctors and biochemists and molecular biologists and all these skill sets that I don't have, but when we work together as a team, I think what we're working on now is about to be a super cool uh, product, project, um, outcome, whatever you want to call it. But my current goal is kind of this nested human-centered design approach in order to build better therapeutics. Um, so my first three years of my PhD, I was working primarily on nanoparticle-based uh, delivery platforms. And then I came here to kind of finish up uh, part of that work. And when I came here, it dawned on me that Although it was pretty cool what I was working on, it wasn't necessarily the most applicable piece of technology. Right. Um, and so as you're chatting, you're like, I was, I was designing something that was still meant to be injected, uh, which, you know, it didn't really dawn on me, dawn on me until I think I was like here and I was like, oh yeah, well, it's, yeah, wait, my product still, like, yeah, maybe I, I reduce side effects or I reduce costs because I'm delivering less of the drug mm -hmm. um, or like less remains in the syringe or whatnot. Yeah. But ultimately, like, it doesn't solve the problem of reaching the people who are yeah, most accessible is yeah like, most neglected yeah. most in need the ones who I mean, if we're talking about that overlaid map like not a lot of those places are in direct uh, contact with our research sites or a research site in Colombia that seems kind of stupid right and so just casual conversations that started with doctors at Sudan uh, they were like you know I think actually it would be really cool to have something that maybe just wasn't injectable. Um, so aside from like having, these are, again, the engineer is me, is like looking at design constraints, right? So originally it was like lower toxicity or higher specificity or, mm -hmm. or whatnot. And then now I'm like, okay, non-parental, so non-injected uh, route of delivery, like that would also be pretty cool. And so that was all very, very, very interesting. And originally I was like, okay, well like, I also had done a little bit of work with microneedle patches. This amazing uh, professor had the opportunity to work with at Georgia Tech um, who makes flu vaccines, and essentially you can't even tell that there's needles. Uh, they only go through the top uh, layer of your skin. So it'd almost be like if you have a Band-Aid and you put the mm -hmm. Band-Aid on and then you just hold in the Band-Aid for about 30 seconds, mm -hmm. and then when you remove, it's created little micro-indentations and has delivered the, the drug. So using kind of a nested human-centered design approach means that I'm actually doing uh, in-depth interviews and focus group discussions with both patients themselves throughout Colombia, uh, both ones that we see in cities and ones that we see in their own community or in rural environments, as well as the actor, actual doctors, health promoters, and community health workers that work with them in order to figure out what are their actual preferences uh, for a therapeutic delivery system mm -hmm. um, and what are their actual desired clinical output outputs. So some people might say, oh, I could deal with XYZ side effect, but these two side effects are non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. um, like, I, I don't know, it could be a variety of things, but I know some people are more willing to tolerate some things than another. Um, and really that was me thinking like, yeah, patch is cool, but what if the patient, like the patch is fine, but like the patch itself won't stay on, or they know that they don't use band-aids. Like, what about a cream? What about a spray? What about, mm -hmm. like, there are a lot of other types of topical delivery routes, mm -hmm. uh, that could kind of get to that. So that's kind of the first part, or I guess my nested parts, so they're going to go kind of in parallel, is actually just chatting with them in order to get uh, both their experience with what they're currently using, so kind of in quantitative measurements, what is it that they like and don't like about their current treatment that they had. So I'll be interviewing people who are taking the pill form and people who are getting the injections mm -hmm. and trying to see if there's any similarities, you know, are they, do they just want a pill form also? Like that could be also fine, but maybe I'm working on a different type of a formulation within that pill. Mm -hmm. um, and so then the next part, aside from their experience, uh, but also kind of like how does that impact their quality of life? Um, and then trying to really think about uh, uh, kind of satisfaction, quality of life, how does that interface? And then really the acceptability of different technology options. So that will be guiding kind of the more patient arm of my research. Mm -hmm. And the second was just really looking at, okay, so I've been working under the assumption also, not necessarily the assumption, but... Um, premise. Premise that I was going to be delivering it to healthy skin. Turns so I was saying out. that you can actually deliver it to the lesion, and they've actually found really 
interesting uh, kind of scientific outputs by stuff that's delivered to the lesion directly. And so they found that, um, so even if I deliver something locally, you can actually have a systemic response, even if it's kind of supposed to be contained within the lesion. And a lot of times things get difficult in, in delivery of medicines because we have such a strong uh, barrier system. Our skin is actually quite difficult to get through. Yeah. And so especially with like nanoparticles, um, there are a lot of things that can really hinder progress through or they can get stuck somewhere, you know, pore size. You're basically looking at like some very um, set routes of what you can get through the skin and what you can't without doing some type of an abrasion. So like a patch system is an abrasion. But what I also realized is that, you know, we have a disease that naturally creates an opening. Mm -hmm. So why is it that we're all still, you know, everyone's still looking at, like, okay, oral, mm -hmm. even though it's open. Or, okay, like, I'll put the patch next to the lesion. Mm -hmm. uh, but really what I could do is just put something directly into the lesion. Mm -hmm. So the next half, the book, and these are the first two parts of my, my work that I'm doing right now, is actually analyzing what's going on at the lesion site. So, um... I mean both kind of structurally, but also in terms of how permeable is it? Are there regions that have higher permeation? It's a clearly an open wound, right? Clearly, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that led to the, f the first idea of mine, which is really just so, I'm doing a lot of like computational work, I'm analyzing what the elasticity of the lesion is, what's the conductivity, what's the permeability, what's the retention of various aspects to figure out like, hey, maybe it's best if you deliver right in the center of the lesion, or maybe it's better if I deliver where the immune cells are. So that's the first part, is really just like Analyzing the lesion so I can figure out how to deliver mm -hmm. my the the therapy that I've come up with, mm -hmm. and then the other one is so I now know how I want to deliver it from an engineering standpoint, right? I want to deliver it to the center of the lesion for X number of hours or whatnot, and then the patients will come in and be like, yeah, I want that delivered via spray to that point, right? So that's how those two are going to merge. But the other thing I said, it kind of looks like an open wound, right? Yeah. So right now we're using these like pretty nasty chemicals. Uh, so it's either chemotherapy or heavy metals into your body, systemically delivered, right? Mm. So the, the pills are chemotherapy, the injections are heavy metal antimonials. And um, there's actually been a lot of work that has just been done straight on wound healing. And so I'm also trying to figure out if I even need to deliver an anti-parasitic compound. Um, so that's the more expensive part of the treatment, right? So that if you were just to avoid that, you would almost virtually reduce the cost of almost nothing. Cause you, and you, it doesn't yeah, matter if you don't have access to it because you don't even need it anyways. Yeah. Um, and what they found from, there's this, my preferred method, if you have a, an arm lesion, you can look it up yourself, but you also might want to do this too. Um, they now do something called thermotherapy which is like say you have like an arm lesion or a leg lesion and it's not very big and you don't show any signs of it being present in your lymph nodes, they essentially just burn it. And they found that from burning it and basically producing a mass chaos event at the site of the lesion, mm -hmm. you can actually have a full systemic reaction that promotes wound healing and then kills off the parasite. And so my idea is if you can do that with thermotherapy, you can also do that with a lot of other things, perhaps, delivered to the site. Yeah. So kind of the second part of mine is fully develop, developing everything out, but maybe not even having in some type of a, a anti-parasitic compound, but instead working with wound healing agents or wound healing techniques. And so I also do a lot of tissue engineering. Um, I do, I mean, that also encompasses within biomaterials, but there are a lot of more tissue engineering routes or more wound healing routes that you can take to look at a problem where up until now we've just thought of as purely, you know, a kind of nasty treatment mm -hmm. um, type of a yeah. disease. You can make it much more simplistic. Much more simplistic. And so I think that we don't even need to be all that complicated, but we are being complicated right now. Because um, you're an engineer. Yeah, yeah. So like, I'm looking <laughs> for efficiency. Yeah. I'm looking for absolutely I'll everything. Solve all of it. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the, the next little part is, is actually doing that and then making the patches. So again, using a, tech, uh, a blend of kind of like nanotech, tissue engineering, and um, biomaterials techniques, everything from electro spinning or electro spraying, kind of like a rumple stilt skin. We just like put the polymer in that has the stuff and we like spin out little fibers and then we like spray them with more nanoparticles. Um, and it's... Um, yeah, uh, so like using all these techniques to actually create them, and then the final part of that human-centered design work is re-coming back here once I have my final product that's based on kind of, I guess, more of like a rational way to design from my perspective that includes both engineering design constraints and patient-centered design constraints, mm -hmm. and actually having the patients uh, test out, uh, not necessarily containing an active ingredient, but 
giving me their feedback on the acceptability and feasibility of the design that I've actually developed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that we never do in grad school is actually at the end go back and say like, hey, yeah, you did all this work and yeah, that's enough to give you a PhD, but like, did you actually achieve what you set out to achieve? And for some people, their, their aims or their goals are much more laboratory based. For me, and I think where my heart always is, is much more patient oriented mm -hmm. um, in the sense that like, yeah, I, I think by that point I will have definitely covered all my scientific aims, but my real rationale for doing the project was to actually have an impact on patients and develop yes. something that they want. And I would hope that at the end, you know, the, the end groups and interviews that I do actually show that the product I've created is something that's desired. Because then you can then take that to people and be like, hey, we have something that works, and we also have something that patients say that they want. Mm -hmm. um, and, and hopefully that impact would be much greater. <laughs>